evening everyone i welcome you all uh, to our third webinar which is uh, part of the webinar series on uh, the impact of covid-19 and uh, which is jointly organized by the uh, niti aayog chair and the indian econometric society in collaboration with rajasthan economic association uh, the topic for today's discussion is the impact of uh, covid-19 on uh, the rural development and uh, indian agriculture Uh, on indian economy and the way forward uh, the webinar is chaired by professor vijay veer singh who is a professor of economics and presently dean faculty of social sciences at the university of rajasthan jaipur uh, and uh, we have the uh, uh, eminent panel uh, who will be speaking on the issue uh, starting with we will have our first panelist uh, dr sudha narayanan who is uh, working as the associate professor with indira gandhi institute of development research mumbai and uh, she has been extensively working on the area of agriculture and labor the second panelist is uh, professor rohini somanathan who will be speaking on uh, rural development strategy and is working with uh, the delhi school of economics new delhi and she has worked extensively in the area of development economics uh, focusing on the social institutions uh, how to interact with the public policies our third panelist is uh, uh, ms sujana krishnamurthy Uh, who will be speaking on the agro livelihood uh, by sharing her uh, field experiences and she has been working with the uh, past 10 years with the under the mango tree society as an executive director our fourth panelist is professor uh, cs shekhar who is uh, who's going to speak on the uh, agriculture produce markets and food prices and is working with uh, the institute of economic growth new delhi and has been working extensively in the area of agriculture and uh, agriculture produce markets our last panelist uh, will be professor uh, dr k shanmugam who is working as associate professor with the ms university baroda and uh, who will be who has worked extensively in the area of field of macroeconomic modeling uh, agriculture production and productivity and total factor productivity to name a few uh, uh, that is the introduction of all uh, of our uh, eminent uh, uh, resource person so i'll be handing over to professor vijay veer singh who will be introducing the theme for all our panelists as the chair and then we will be starting off with the speakers one by one so i'll uh, hand over to you sir now uh, good afternoon uh, first of all i welcome all the distinguished panelists who spared their valuable time uh, to participate in this webinar i also welcome all the participants of this webinar as the as we know this is the third uh, webinar in series on a very important topic of uh, rural development and uh, agriculture when we talk of agriculture we say that is generally we divide rural development two categories that is the farm activities and non farm activities so if you look at the farm activity activity or you look at the agriculture sector it is raakond irony there is an irony that is we say that farmer is the food provider or we say it is the anadata for us and that class in is in distress particularly for last two decades we tried our level best giving highest level of possible subsidies in different areas but problem continues that we say that is the that uh, the problem is of Lab there, and today we are expecting from panelists that research is one aspect. What we feel exactly after COVID, how the situation in rural areas is going to change, how it is going to be the farmers or the agriculture class is going to be affected. I will not say there are no successes successes in agriculture. we have done quite good comparatively if we look after uh, independence but situation remains say you can categorize that class is glass is less than half full whether you compare land productivity labor productivity or income of farmers sometimes we say that can government do something in agriculture or the farmer have to look uh, at themselves only three area generally we explore one is the productivity that less increase the productivity then question certainly 
which certainly the Shekhar or Sanungam will be replying that if we increase the productivity, where we are going to take this production or the output of ours, particularly in the light of present context of WTO conditions. Second, we have been suggesting that uh, farm diversification, that is certainly the crop diversification is important, but there are certain constraints in crop, diversi uh, crop diversification, livestock in another area, they, those questions certainly will be picked up. And third area is certainly, Shekhar is going to speak on agriculture produce marketing. We are blaming Agriculture APMC Act from day one that it is encouraging the interference of intermediaries. Now, government has gone for certain reforms in APMC market and gone for the contract farming also, which we are debating for a long time. With what we are expecting with these agriculture market reforms is that private sector investment will be coming in, private buyers will be coming in directly. But again, we have to look at the contract laws, which we provide at present. And another important aspect is with contract farming, do we expect in country like India that corporate people will be reaching directly to farmers or there is important role of farmers producer organizations to see the interest of local community, local farmers. One area we cover that is in reforms that is essential community market or one lakh crore grant uh, this uh, agriculture infrastructure fund these funds are supposed to create investment in supply chain. I hope that happens and uh, how they are going to impact agriculture. One aspect we say that is, if these type of suggestions have been given in the past, we implemented some suggestions also, but why things did not change in past. And then we see that there is surplus labor in agriculture when surplus labor has to move out then the per capita farmer income or per capita household income in rural areas can can go up but looking at the situation in of covid 19 when you see the clear demarcation between india and bharat reverse migration people are moving back to rural areas in that case the question will certainly be asked that there is important role because the poor people are mi migrating to urban areas in search of some opportunity. The government has to ensure their security, their safety, social protection, and certainly the capacity building that they should be so, that capable that they can earn their bread in case of emergency or here they have some savings in case of uh, pandemics like COVID. So I welcome you all again and I will stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, we'll be moving on to our first panelist. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Sudhan Narayan. Uh, she'll be uh, taking over from here. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, panel. Uh, it's an important issue and uh, I thought in my uh, talk I would focus on farming and uh, rural employment. Uh, and uh, I don't think I want to look too far into the future, but I'd rather like to share uh, where we are today and what we can expect to happen in the next few months. So I have a much shorter time horizon. And I suppose the advantage of being the first panel in a, the first speaker in an illustrious panel is that I can raise many questions and leave it to the other panelists to actually answer them. Uh, so I think uh, all of us know this that uh, the pandemic is one issue, uh, but the lockdown and the consequences of the lockdown have been the larger problem. And we know that in the early days of the lockdown, agri food supply chains unraveled. And there was a lot of uncertainty, anxiety, and stress associated with every person linked to the supply chain, starting from farmer 
to the retail vendors in the cities, to delivery persons in e-commerce um, companies. So we know all of that happened. But we also at the same time saw a lot of small innovations coming up. FPO stepped in to fill in the gaps in the supply chain. Uh, many agri-tech startups started trying to innovate and connect uh, consumers and farmers. Farmers themselves, many of them found their own ways of reaching out to consumers. So there was a bit of, uh, uh, there were a few positive stories. Unfortunately, not of the scale that could have uh, uh, fully mitigated the consequences of the lockdown. And we know that recently the macro data is suggesting that agriculture may be the one that's leading us out of this crisis. And uh, the RBI governor yesterday was quoted as saying that it, uh, agriculture offers a ray of hope. And we know that the uh, area under crop has increased by 34% to from 50 lakh hectares to 67. And uh, I think so in that context, it is true that agriculture has been relatively less hit uh, com as compared with the industry, manufacturing, and many services sectors. Mm, and I think it's, uh, I offer three sort of possible reasons why we haven't seen such a big impact. One is the lockdown happened during the Rabi season, which uh, in rain fed agriculture, anyway, farmers don't grow much in the, not many farmers grow crops in the Rabi season unless you have irrigation. So, in that sense, the loss coming from marketing was just confined to people who are growing certain kinds of crops and in certain geographies. The other important thing is, unlike the Western factory farms, large scale, high investment, uh, we have a very complex institutional structure. Where it's a mosaic of many, many actors and a lot of institutional diversity, which I think endows the agri-food supply chains with a bit of resilience. And I think these were uh, things that held up agriculture. But at the same time, I want to emphasize that the complacency that agriculture is going to lead us out is actually a bit, uh, uh, it's, it's a bit dangerous. And I want to share with you uh, a couple of uh, uh, results from a survey that we conducted with farmers. And I'm just going to share my screen right now. Uh, I'm hoping it's working. Yeah. Uh, so this, as we know that, uh, as uh, and Professor Singh already said that rural is not always agriculture. And now we have a lot of non-farm participation. The National Sample Survey suggested that 32% of farm household incomes is coming from males. And we know that this term plural activities is something that we've come to accept as a fact in rural uh, communities. And in our survey of around 370 people, where we did a telephone survey of people we had surveyed earlier, and we did this in nine states over the past one and a half months, uh, we found that 39% said the lockdown had affected them very badly. And if you look at the figures, it says uh, close to a quarter actually had a household member who lost a job. That's the extent of exposure of farm households to non-farm incomes. And many of them were actually in the cities, in distant cities. And even more worrying is that here are our Anudatas, as Professor Singh said, and our Anudatas had to borrow food, rely on others for food, or skip a meal at least once in the past week. And that figure is 23%. And 40% are worried about getting food in adequate quantity and variety in the village. And obviously, much higher proportions are worried about earning incomes and uh, finding work. And among those who are indebted, 85% said they're worried about paying back loans and they're not able to do that. So in that context, I think the agriculture distress is fairly high. The only reason we don't know this is because we haven't found a way uh, ways to find out about it. And I think surveys like this, and I want to uh, compliment uh, the Center for uh, Sciences and Agriculture, CSA. They've done a survey of 1,000 farmers, uh, farm households, along with Harvard uh, Public Health School and uh, PHFI. And they find very similar uh, results. And they also find that where cash transfers have come in, people are less worried about the next season. And they also find that uh, uh, where direct procurement has happened, like in Punjab and Haryana, where it's happened relatively effectively, there people have more cash to spend in the next season. So I think in a way, uh, we have to look at this cropping area increase uh, as a 
as much as a sign of distress as it is actually of uh, things looking fine in the agricultural sector. And I want to talk a bit about the big picture now. Now, in terms of future, what do we expect to happen? Uh, the nature of transformation in the Indian uh, agriculture sector is such that uh, people from farm households typically typically go to poor quality, low wage jobs in the city. And uh, they are part of what you'd call the precariat. Uh, and uh, they are never delinked from the land. So in terms of transfer of excess surplus labor from farm to non-farm hasn't fully happened in the sense that they always have land as a fallback option and they can go to any time. And that's partly because land markets are not very good, but also because of their precariousness in the uh, urban uh, sector. And I want to say that many of these migrants are not very committed to life in the city because of the conditions. And that's going to determine whether they are going to come back into the cities for work or stay back and explore alternatives. And here I have a couple of uh, uh, quotes from a field study we did in Madhya Pradesh and Tamil Nadu. And uh, Tamil Nadu aspirations to non-farm employment is very high. In Madhya Pradesh, it's not. Essentially, in Madhya Pradesh, a young farmer was saying that work in the city is very taxing. We would sleep for an hour and work the rest of the time. I got so weak that I had to come back. A young farmer was saying that when I talk to my friends who go out to migrate, they say you're better off in the village farming. And in fact, if there was enough water, we would stay back too. And then when I asked them to take me with them to the town for experience, they say, no, you're better off here and be happy with what you are. So this is a kind of an indication that we can't expect migrants to return anytime soon uh, and they may stay on. But then the agriculture has very limited capacity to absorb all of them. For one thing, those who have land are going to increasingly depend on family labor and are not going to hire in labor to save costs. And this is again a finding that's come out from surveys, uh, telephone surveys during this period. The other thing is that the to work in school and never really learn skills in farming. So this, these two are big hurdles for them to get absorbed in the agriculture sector. And as we know, the cropping pattern could shift out. So the, uh, given these limits to agricultural uh, capacity to absorb uh, return migrants, I think we have a rather than relief. And I believe that it has to focus on relief uh, mainly because many of the announcements of example, for example, the one lakh crore fund is actually credit that's going to take time to put in place and eventually reach the beneficiaries. So we are not going to see immediate impacts of many of these uh, the infrastructure investment schemes that have been uh, proposed. So right now the need of is direct intervention in terms of money. Asset transfers are going to be important so that people are not uh, undertaking distress CLO assets. And the decentralized processing, this is a good opportunity to decentralize economic activity that's agro-based. And I think Sujana will talk a bit about uh, her experience. And I think we need to think differently about the scale of operations. Of course, there are severe limits to how, what scale of enterprises you can have in these places. But I think we need to think creatively about this. And uh, last but not least, I think we need a very stable, credible NREG working uh, as a fallback option so that uh, if agriculture is to lead us out of this crisis, I think NREG is going to have an important role in keeping people, uh, people's heads above waters at this stage. I'll stop there and thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, now we'll be moving to our next uh, speaker, Professor Rohini Somanathan, uh, who will be speaking on the rural development strategy. Yeah, over to you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Yash. Can you all hear me? Yes, ma'am, you can. You, you can. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I'm going to um, start by just broad principles of development policy and uh, then try to get into existing relief and policy measures that have been announced and then sum up. So those are the, those are the three parts. Um, the most important starting point is to recognize that development policy has to take into account where people live because it's for them that you're making the policy. 
And the biggest change that we've seen is really where people are going to be living, where they live now and where they're going to be living. So some of the poorest parts of the country, uh, which are under most resource strain, uh, like Rajasthan and Bihar, uh, they also have had the largest inflows of migrants. And so we have to take that into account in any policy we think of going forward. Uh, so what are the challenges of this policy? Um, I'd say there are three. Uh, one is massive relief to people who won't necessarily have residential identities in the villages that they're moving to. They might not have Russian cards. Uh, they might not be on the block lists. Whatever it takes, we have to get relief to them. And they might not have been residents of these villages for quite a while. The second uh, challenge is generating livelihoods. So many of these people we've seen in media reports, we've seen photographs, we've looked at TV coverage. Uh, they've gone through really traumatic journeys home. And if they find local livelihoods, they're not going to want to leave anytime soon. Uh, a big challenge will be to generate those livelihoods. Uh, the third challenge is sustainability. Um, because these areas were already under some strain and our challenge will now be to see whether we can get development taking place in these areas. If we can get that to happen, then as a country we will be much more sustainable because you will not have people traveling large distances for work. Uh, at an emotional level, we realized that people were separated and those separations were traumatic. So the welfare effects would be far beyond anything that we would have imagined if we can generate local livelihoods. Um, there are these challenges, but there are also a lot of opportunities. I think part of the problem has been that our policymakers have imagined villages to be just populated with farmers and with laborers. Uh, but there are a lot of other people in these villages, and even more so now, uh, when we have people going back, we have carpenters, we have tailors, we have masons, we have small shopkeepers, we have office clerks. We have a lot of people. They have a lot of skills. And not only do they have skills, but they have all the perspective that comes from travel, from seeing that things can be done in a different way. And they have attachment to their villages. So um, if we can actually use these skills, then uh, it really provides us with great opportunity. And so we have to focus on those. Um, now, what does that mean for policy? So let's think of the big picture. What does it mean? I think one thing is that we have to take local context into, into account. We can't make an agricultural policy in a drought prone area, which is the same as one in a you know, excess rainfall area. Uh, these are going to be different. So local context matters. It matters not just for agriculture, it matters for everything. Uh, we've seen with COVID that some areas have been re re uh, relatively free of uh, the COVID impact. Other areas have been hard hit. So context matters. And what that means for policy is to decentralize. Decentralize from the center to the states, from the states to local governments. Uh, that process has to be done. And that's politically difficult. People don't give up power. They feel that they know what is best for the lower levels. Um, we have to recognize that they don't. And if they don't recognize it, we have to, we have to voice uh, the importance of the local. Uh, the second thing is local when it can be done. So the prime minister has called for vocal for local, but it's very important to understand what that means. Uh, it doesn't mean wearing khadi. It doesn't mean buying things made in India. I think all of those things would take us backwards. Uh, it does mean procure locally where you can, generate jobs locally where you can. Um, those don't compromise quality, they will improve the, the standard of living. Um, so local when it can be done, and it doesn't compromise um, quality. The third is, and think about local as what people want to be local. So think about local as the area people want to live. Don't make local the country when the local that's relative to, re relevant to someone might be a village. Uh, the third is the state has to provide public goods. 
Um, many people live very hard lives in the city, partly because they think the schools are better, health systems might be better, the children might have a better future. Uh, they can't provide that in the village. Locally, people will never have the resources for that. That's what the center and the states have to come and do in a big way, is build infrastructure. Um, so let me talk a couple of minutes about existing policies and how they can move us in this direction. So in the very short run, it's fanciful to imagine that the government is going to do something very different. So let's suggest changes that are small that they might be willing to do. Um, so what have they announced so far? They've announced this Garib Kalyan package has announced food grains, uh, Ujwala cylinders through the Ujwala program, uh, and an increased allocation through the NREGS and they've increased the borrowing um, limits of SAGs, and they've decided to promote farmer producer organizations. So what can we do with these existing schemes? Well, one very simple thing is instead of PDS grains going out of the village through procurement systems and then coming back into the village, let any farmer register themselves as someone who can provide under the PDS. Then what people will be willing to do is to just get their allocation locally. Um, the production will be good because people will care about selling good stuff to people in their villages. And you won't have a lot of transport costs, a lot of red tape, a lot of wastage when things go out and then come back in. Um, that's one. Uh, the second thing is let sponges determine beneficiaries. You're not going to be able to figure out who's in a village uh, from an aerial view. You'll have to go down to the village, let local governments do this. Um, on, the, on the NREGS, uh, it's good that the NREGS wages have gone up to 202. Um, but let's think of the NREGS beyond construction work, beyond agricultural work. Let's think of it as subsidizing other work. So suppose there's a factory that's willing to be located in a village, uh, why can't we give the NREGS wage and then they pay the remainder? These kinds of policies have worked very well in many countries. In Germany, for example, if an employer hires someone who's registered as unemployed, uh, the government pays part of the wage cost, they pay part of the wage cost. Let's try and do this with the NREGS. In terms of self-help groups, that's been one of the great successes in India. Let's allow them to lend to anyone they want, not just to their members. Let's give them a free hand. They will be able to identify what is working in the village, whether they're getting the money back. Let's just, let's just let them lend. Um, and most importantly, let's just not think in terms of, we need food processing or we need you know, this set of farmer producer organizations. Let's leave that to what the village has to offer. And I think if we, if we do those things, then we can not only lead to, it can not only lead to rural recovery and sustainability, um, it will make a lot of people much happier. They'll be with their families. It'll be a different way of life. And I think we can really do it, but it's not going to be done by small changes. It's going to be done by thinking about big changes. Um, so is, I'll stop there. Am I out of time, Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, ma'am, if you wish to conclude, you have one more minute. Um, yeah, well, you know, just one little thing. Uh, what, when we think about promoting organic agriculture or zero budget farming, um, one thing is that it's never going to happen locally if you also have a system which is highly subsidized. So whenever I've gone to villages, I found people saying, look, you know, the costs of producing this are just not going to get us enough uh, as long as there is an alternative parallel system which is highly subsidized. If you take those subsidies out, then organic farming, zero budget farming, which is sustainable, can actually have a future. Um, so let me stop there, Yash. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much, ma'am. Now we'll be moving on to our uh, third uh, speaker, uh, Ms. Sujana Krishnamurthy. Uh, ma'am, over to you now. Yeah, so as you can see, the difference between these two thalis is that if there were no bees, uh, we would probably have only rice and wheat to eat because they are wind pollinated. But four out of the five foods that we eat, which is vegetables, fruits, oil seeds, and pulses, 
all depend on bees for pollination. Uh, you can even see things like chocolate uh, because cocoa depends on bees as does dairy products um, because uh, dairy depends on fodder. So that's how important bees are uh, for our uh, agricultural systems. So in February 2016, the FAO actually put out this game changer statement. Game changer for many of us who have been working for, uh, on this uh, for a while. It actually put out pollination services as an agricultural input, as important as, say, soil, water, and the other things that we generally think of. Drew a, said clearly that smallholders, it was crucial. And they talked about improving pollinator density and diversity, which basically means increasing the number of pollinators as well as the kind of pollinators. And also pointed out how important it was for achieving the SDGs and also adaptation to climate change. Now I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, uh, the organization that I work with under the Mango Tree Society. Uh, we work with uh, indigenous bees, with tribal communities, uh, with smallholder farmers in states in the country, Gujarat, Maharashtra, and Madhya Pradesh. Uh, now, the important thing is that um, um, the first National Commission on Agriculture way back in 1976 had actually talked about beekeeping as an agricultural input and created a roadmap up to uh, the year 2000. But subsequent agricultural policy actually uh, focused on large farmers. Uh, so in some sense, that was lost. Uh, these are figures that you can see that have been put out by the National Horticulture Mission, which talk about the potential increases in yields for various crops. So what we do at under the Mango Tree Society, we, even now, even before I started working with the UTMT, all of us think of uh, bees is equal to honey. But the most important thing is that uh, the role that bees play in agriculture is almost 40, 14 times more than what we think of, which is the honey. What do we do? We promote beekeeping with indigenous bees uh, to increase agricultural productivity and uh, enhance incomes and increase the livelihoods of marginal farmers in India. Our framework, uh, we work on indigenous bees for a particular reason, because they are smallholder friendly. They are available across the country, uh, from Jammu and Kashmir to Kanyakumari. It's low cost. You don't have to bring the bees from anywhere outside. And the other critical thing, which we've been talking about, which is increasing livelihoods, uh, we actually provide training and handholding support for farmers for an entire year at the farm gate. This was actually a critical gap that most agricultural extension services um, suffer from. Uh, they train farmers for 15 to 20 days and think that the skill is gone. But actually, farmers require a lot more handholding. Uh, we also create a local cadre of master trainers so that the program can be scaled up. And also a critical component is developing a beekeeping ecosystem of a crisis. For example, local carpenters are trained to produce bee boxes, women's groups produce um, bee whales and other things. So what happens is that um, there are a number of other employment opportunities that are created around the beekeeping value chain. Uh, the last is that because bees pollinate a two kilometer radius, if you have 10 beekeepers in a village, the pollinator cover for the entire community actually increases. Here you can see some pictures. Uh, these are local carpenters in Gujarat, uh, women in SHG groups. The other thing that we added to the program a couple of years ago uh, was adding seeds and saplings, which are very bee friendly. It could be uh, local uh, crops, local plants, um, uh, you can see goats there because goats are very well pollinated by bees, uh, saplings that are distributed in monsoon time, which are local. So what this does is that it, it exploits the win-win relationship between bees and some of these uh, plants, thereby creating more income for farmers. So I'll actually talk about the potential of this intervention by focusing on a particular block uh, in uh, Gujarat. As you can see, this is a Gujarat which is very different from uh, the Gujarat that we are spoken to, uh, Gujarat that, uh, that is spoken to, to us. The majority of the farmers here are tribal. They belong to particular communities. 78% of the farmers are BPL, are predominantly small and marginal farmers. And 78% of the farmers said that they or somebody in their families migrated out of the village to find other sources of income. So what, when beekeeping is introduced in villages like these, what happens is that the, there is an increase in crop yields. Um, there is a, honey is also a byproduct. 
the environment also benefits greatly by making this highly sustainable. Uh, you can see in this graph, uh, what are all the um, impacts that the farmers spoken about. 93% uh, of them saw an increase in uh, crop production. They acquired new skills. Honey was available in their backyard. They got more respect in society, etc. So beekeeping is not just a skill. And when I say beekeeping, this is just one example. I'm sure there are a lot of other activities which can similarly, similarly make an impact on rural communities. In fact, here. So here you can see, uh, because when one says that beekeeping increases yields, the question which naturally comes, especially in this gathering of economists, is that what could be the potential increase? And here you can see uh, we have a, a monitoring and evaluation team uh, which uh, is constantly monitoring the yields, doing baselines, end lines, collecting yields as they come. Uh, so you can see that in the case of um, uh, the beekeepers and the control group, these are crops that are actually affected by having just two to three bee boxes on the farm. Mango, bitter goat, cashew, niger, tuvar, urad, all of them have seen some kind of an increase. And even for the farmers, the post bee box uh, production was compared to the pre bee box production. And here again, you can see uh, fairly large increases. Now, where, what do these increases translate in terms of income for the farmers is what you can see. Even for the beekeepers, there's been a substantial increase uh, in average income that has been earned from cash crops like mango, uh, both in ter terms of cashew, niger, and all of that. And the other tables that I've not added are that self-consumption has also increased for these farm families. Besides the increase in yields, because of the supplementary activities that are introduced, farmers are able to sell bee colonies, they earn extra money from that. Bee flora, like chili, tomato, and brinjal, farmers were able to produce more and sell more because of better pollination. Honey was a byproduct. Um, the other aspect that we've introduced is creating more livelihood opportunities for women over here uh, who developed these bee flora nurseries and sold bee flora to beekeepers and thereby earned income. Uh, so this is a quick uh, overview of what intervention is all about. Now, how does this impact COVID, as, uh, which is what we are talking about today? A study that was done by uh, Gram Vikas, which is an organization in Orissa, and CMID in Trivandrum, they did a phone survey with 392 uh, migrant workers in the first week of May. And uh, as, as mentioned, this area, this period has been a very traumatic period for migrants. And many migrants have said that they, they would not like to come back to urban areas. So this survey actually quantified it and said that at least half of the migrants said that if they got an income of 5,000 to 10,000 rupees at their villages, they would not be coming back to the cities. A quarter of them said that if they got income between 10 to 15,000 rupees at the villages, they, will, they would prefer to stay back. So what uh, I guess someone had mentioned before me, these are the kind of opportunities, unfortunately, which COVID has created in the sense that what are the value chains that set up in villages beekeeping could be one option you have an entire value chain over there and this is only half of it if one talks about the bottling of honey and labeling and all of that and uh, wax which we haven't even come up to there's a whole set of activities that can be created around value chains in this case beekeeping it could well be poultry it could well be other things so the point is that this is an opportunity which we probably need to look at with uh, fresh eyes new eyes and uh, see how we can um, harness it. Um, I think I'm going to stop here. And uh, if there are any questions, I'd like to take that later. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, ma'am, for your presentation. Uh, yeah, if, yeah, we'll be now moving on to Professor Shekhar. Uh, yes, sir, over to you now. Hi, yes. good evening, everyone. So. Uh, actually, my task becomes a lot more easier after Sudha and Rohini's uh, presentations on the uh, rural employment aspect. Uh, I'll be basically giving a, a broad macro view of what happened to agriculture during the uh, pandemic phase of this pandemic in the last two months or so. And then I'll briefly touch upon the recent uh, stimulus package that has been announced by the finance minister. And uh, what are the good points about it? What are 
what is actually missing from there and what needs to be done. These are roughly the things that I'm looking at. Now, actually, uh, you must have seen in the reports that uh, Niti Aayog has uh, actually projected uh, a growth rate of around 3% for uh, agriculture. And this is remarkable because coming by on the back of nearly 3.7% growth last year, and also when other, all other sectors are reeling uh, in the current scenario, it's a remarkable, it's, it's a miraculous performance. But then, does growth automatically translate into higher incomes for farmers, higher incomes from all the stakeholders in agriculture? Perhaps that's a, that's a moot point that uh, one needs to discuss. No, uh, not only growth, actually agriculture has many dimensions. For example, what is the food production? What is its distribution? How, uh, what is the employment aspect? So these are all the things that uh, I'll briefly touch upon. Actually, the production has been uh, really a bumper production this year. In fact, the recent, very recent third uh, advanced estimates actually uh, show record production of food grains in the country. So there is no reason to believe that uh, it will be anything other than that. And then, uh, yes, I think there are these notifications popping up. Uh, yes, sir, you can continue, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry. So, uh, yeah, the production, uh, on the production side, it, it appears to be uh, pretty good. And uh, even the uh, procurement, procurement has been really brisk. Initially, when the season started uh, with this COVID uh, pandemic hit, the rabi harvesting was about to take place and the procurement, uh, there were major apprehensions about uh, what the procurement will be like. But uh, the procurement has been really brisk and they have met most of the targets. And uh, I think uh, some part of the credit should go to the various steps that have been taken by the central and state governments. Uh, like, for example, staggering procurement actually delaying procurement in certain uh, regions of the country and then actually allowing farmers to uh, sell directly from FTOs and uh, registered warehouses. And there are various other measures that have taken, which I think have played some role in this uh, thing. And then coming to the next aspect of stocks, actually. At the beginning of... Uh, this uh, whole thing on 1st of April, India nearly had around 57 million tons of food grains, which is way above the buffer stock now. And then in this season, the expected procurement is 51 million tons. And the outgo on all the programs, including the recently announced uh, uh, free grain distribution of 5 kg under Garib Kalyan and Yojana, and also to the migrants, free distribution of migrants, which was announced just a few days ago, including the outcome on all these programs put together will be roughly around 31 million tons. So out of the procurement of 51, 31 will be spent on these programs and then we'll still be left with nearly 20 million tons. If you add it to the already existing 57 uh, million tons, so it, it makes it a comfortable 77 million tons by the end of July, uh, sorry, by the beginning of July. And which is again way above the norms. So what I'm trying to say is the production is good, the, even the upcoming uh, for, uh, the outlook for the upcoming Kharif season is also very good because the fertilizer uptake, the uh, sale of seeds, the tractor sales, everything, all the macro indicators seem to suggest a very good bumper Kharif crop. So on the supply side, there's, there's hardly anything, particularly for the staple seeds to worry about at the macro level. Now, whether the distribution is actually happening to the states and below uh, even lower levels is a different issue. So now coming to the distribution of this, this food that is available to the states, I think uh, there also it, it, it has uh, roughly, uh, the situation is, uh, I think, uh, satisfactory because uh, the FCA has managed to send most of the grain that is required under both NFSA and also all these new schemes to the states. Now states, how they are actually distributing to the lower levels is not really clear. Now, but I presume that states are doing a better job because they have lifted all their allocations. So even the distribution appears to be fine. So as far as the staple cereals is concerned, there appears to be very little problem. 
But we cannot say the same about many other commodities. For example, perishables. As you must have seen, there are reports of widespread damage and losses to various crops like grapes, mangoes, pineapples, and uh, uh, marigold flowers, and many other such uh, basically fruits and vegetables have, have taken a big hit, mainly because of the supply chain uh, disruptions, transport networks not being able to work uh, at the fullest, and uh, that actually impacted these farmers to a great extent. And some of the other commodities like milk and sugar consumption also has declined drastically because the bulk consumption has decreased. That is hotels, restaurants and catering services. Their demand has fallen drastically and that, that has impacted. So this, this and uh, the other effect is, this is so the farmers of perishable crops are going to their incomes have taken a huge hit. And also, as you have seen, most of the labor, I think the labor uh, who put, who, the rural to rural migration is nearly 50% of the seasonal migration in India, roughly around 45% of the total seasonal migration is accounted for by rural to rural uh, migration, which is basically for agricultural operations. And those uh, labor could not actually move to uh, move because of this movement restrictions and their incomes have been hit very badly. So, although the supply side, on the supply side, it, it, it appears to be good, the main problems are emanating on the demand side. Then what needs to be done? So, there are many things that need to be done, but before I come to what needs to be done, I'll, I'll just touch upon what has been done in the recent stimulus package. Not to, uh, the Prime Minister, sorry, the Finance Minister has announced various measures but if you look at those measures, almost all of them, in fact, all of them actually are long-term measures on the supply side. They do very little to actually spur up demand in the immediate future. So although they are, there are some excellent measures for long-term growth of agriculture, for example, ECA uh, doing away with restrictions under uh, Essential Commodities Act, and also bringing or this talk about bringing in a new central law to allow farmers to trade across states, which, which I think is a wonderful thing if it really happens, because there are, it's a big if. And, uh, and also this uh, huge infrastructure fund that has been created. So these are all very good measures if implemented well. So implementation is the key. So we'll have to keep our fingers crossed. But what uh, needs to be done immediately is that, like uh, Sudha has mentioned, there is very little focus on relief. So the relief aspect is missing. Firstly, the farmers, actually they, they have been given these direct payments on the, under PM Kisan, and those payments have been front loaded in the first uh, package that has been announced by the FN. But that, uh, the compensation, that, uh, the quantum of assistance under the program is very little. Right now it is 2000 per quarter, and at least 6000 should be given, that means it has to be three times what what is being given presently to make a meaningful impact for farmers to meet the expenses for the next season. One. Number two, the rural labor. I think they're, the agricultural labor, I think they're, uh, the direct payments to them is totally conspicuous by absence. I think they actually have taken a big hit and they don't figure anywhere in this uh, whole uh, uh, slew of measures that has been announced. So I think even if uh, there is around seven, 0.6 crores of uh, active Manriga job card holders. And even if you pay them, say, 10 days wages, which amounts to roughly 2,000. In fact, it amounts to more than 2,000. But even if you give them 2,000, which is only just 10 days wages, then even then the expenditure is not very high. And third is the migrants. There are roughly around uh, 1.36 uh, seasonal migrants right now. So if you actually happen to identify them and put the cash directly into their hands, so um, I think the back of the envelope calculation suggests that the, even if you put together all these kinds of assistance to farmers, to labor, and also to the migrants, it comes to roughly around 70,600 crores, which forms just 0.4% of the GDP. This is not much. I think that should have been done in this stimulus package to immediately spur up demand because these, these sections have a large MPC and even for, as an instrument for kicking up, uh, kickstarting the growth, that's very important. So this is one thing. Secondly, I think uh, 
both uh, Sudha as well as uh, uh, Rohini have touched upon this aspect about uh, Manrika. I think Manrika actually they have increased the allocation for Manrika by 40,000 crores. But unfortunately, even now the guidelines are the same. That means Manrika work cannot be taken up on individual private lands. So with the, it, when this whole reverse migration has happened, there is surplus pool of labor in the rural areas. And why can't that labor force be used for uh, upcoming uh, kharif operations, whether it's sowing, plowing, and uh, building harvest, and all kinds of things. Why, once you tweak with those uh, guidelines of Mandriga and allow people, uh, this Mandriga labor to work on individual lands or private lands rather than only on public works, then it, it will take care of a lot of this problem. And secondly, this will also probably perhaps as Vernia has suggested, most labor probably do not want to come back to the uh, cities. So they may actually be uh, encouraged to stay back in their villages and that may also affect stem the migration. So this is one of the uh, important things that need to be done. And these two things are extremely important. And there are some long-term measures which I will not go into right now because there's a, the very fact that there are so many migrants who are actually stranded in cities speaks volumes about our rural development paradigm and what, what, what exactly is happening. Because right now, I'll briefly say one thing, that right now we have a very disjoint strategy of agriculture on one side and rural development on the other side. If you see the programs and schemes that are, there are these huge ministries, two ministries, agriculture and rural development. They have these flagship schemes on uh, agriculture, RKV, NFSM, and all kinds of things. And Manrega is in the rural development, which, which doesn't actually talk to the agriculture ministry while, while devising the program. And so is the National Rural Level, uh, Livelihood Mission, which is about poverty eradication, which is under the Ministry of Rural Development. Again, why is why can't it be dovetailed with the activities happening in the rural regions, agricultural activities? Suppose if a village is uh, covered under National Food Security Mission, growing pulses, then why can't a dal mill be established there? Why can't the women SHGs under NRLM be trained to actually take those pulses to the, I mean, this dal to the nearest markets to sell them? These are some of the issues. Of course, it's easy to uh, say that, but it, it's, it's not difficult to imagine a holistic plan if uh, if these two uh, ministries work together, at least at the planning level. Actually, at the implementation and execution level, there can be module, modules and it can be broken down into modules. And, uh, but uh, this kind of integrated vision for agriculture and rural development needs to be evolved if we really have to uh, take care of migration. And here, one needs to one point needs to be remembered. The evidence of the world over suggests that nearly 81% of the reduction in poverty is because of improved conditions in the rural villages and only 19% is because of migration out of rural villages. So that means if you improve the conditions in the rural regions, that's, that's the key to actually uh, moving people out of poverty. So that that's a long-term thing, but I don't see any attempt, even any thinking on that. Uh, yeah, with this, I stop, and uh, rest of the things I think I can perhaps take up the uh, you one day as they come along. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, yeah, so I will be moving on to our next uh, speaker, uh, Dr. K. Shanmugan. Uh, yeah, over to you, sir, now. Now, uh, the productivity and production plays a very important role in the agricultural development. Now, if you look at the uh, aspect of the rural background, almost 75% uh, of the rural population depends on agriculture, purely on agriculture. Roughly around 80% of the farmers are small and marginal farmers. And this is the very important background with which policy has to move. This is a very important background with which productivity has to be thought of. Now, for a minute, I would like to brief on the productivity for the benefit of the student. Uh, typically, you must have studied in your microeconomic text uh, at postgraduate and graduate level. The productivity is the measure of a ratio uh, in a way that uh, production, that is output and input, or uh, 
put together as a ratio and arrived at to understand what kind of dynamics it creates. Now it's easy to look at the textbook like this, but in reality, the measurement of uh, productivity, uh, the measurement, the way the way the way you measure the variable, crossly differ. So I'm not going into the deep detail of how do you measure all those things. And only thing that I can submit here, productivity is just not only one concept on average productivity, margin productivity, or total productivity that you have studied in the text. It can vary across and uh, the measurement can vary across. So, so fundamentally the conceptual framework might remain the same. Now most of the data that are generated uh, at Indian level give the productivity in terms of what is known as land productivity. Uh, in terms of crops they give kilograms of uh, a particular crop uh, per hectare or put together they will give an index. Now that will not reveal actually the real issues of the productivity. If you really want to understand productivity, look at the total factor productivity and partial factor productivity, along with the measure that usually promoted and published in the Indian statistical system, that is land productivity. So having been said this, now I would like to touch upon, given the constraints on the time, I would like to touch on very few issues that are remote, that are closely connected, not remotely, closely connected to the productivity. One issue is the farm size and productivity. Now, farm size and productivity relationship is well debated in the Indian context. If you look at the literature in the early 60s, uh, even 70s, as good as late 70s, they found a very strong inverse relationship between farm size and uh, productivity. Whatever the concept that you think of, particularly the land productivity. Now, if you look at the productivity as a measure here, now this is understood, if farm size increases, the application of modernization would increase. So slowly and gradually, the relationship between, the inverse relationship between them is weakened as a result of uh, modernization of the farm, with uh, farms that can take in a different shapes including technology, the, the better management, high yielding varieties, the kind of fertilizer use, change in the agroclimatical condition, etc. So therefore, uh, the, the, the weak relationship suggests uh, that there has to be something which we have to meaningfully think in terms of production, not productivity per se. Now this uh, typical crop land and man ratio, I'm not giving any statistics here. Uh, people thought of improving it by replacing the rural population outside the rural population, or sucking it out from the rural area and putting it elsewhere, either other centers of the rural or in the urban center. And therefore they can improve this ratio and also productivity. Now this has not worked well. This has not worked well and is not going to work well in my own opinion. Therefore, coming back in, coming back uh, to the village, like the sort of a improvement in the man uh, crop uh, land and man ratio, uh, rather than you know looking at it, I would say that increase the productivity and off-farm activities. That's a very important uh, issue. Uh, Non-farm activities, off-farm activities within the village. I think we can think of it. This is one issue. Second, the productivity and wage rate. Now, there is a lot of debate. If you look at the uh, productivity, the productivity has increased over a period of time. For example, labor productivity. Uh, some of you would like to, uh, if you want to understand this issue, you can refer to my paper uh, uh, published in the Journal of uh, uh, Indian Journal of Labor Economics. Uh, and uh, the not only trend and uh, actual productivity index both have increased uh, over a period of time. So there is a, a continuous increase in the labor productivity. Now the percentage with which, the pace with which the labor productivity is increased, the wages have not gone up. Now there are two way people debate about it. Productivity determines the wage and wage determines the productivity. Now uh, in the Indian context, at least productivity has not pushed wage. 
Now, which probably might have something to do, like why there is a low productivity as far as the land productivity is concerned and many other uh, concepts, uh, like you can water productivity. There are many partial productivity can be worked out. Surprisingly, you will find all these productivities fall in real sense, in real terms. Now, now this migration has created two, two three problems. See? One problem is there is going to be an interstate variation in the wage rate. The wage, the where the people have moved out, the wages might go up. Uh, they have people have moved in, that is uh, coming back to the own village, they just might fall down. This kind of temporary phenomena is possible. Second is a government is fully aware of this and they have a policy to arrest this, and I think they are going to. They have, they, uh, to the best of my knowledge, there is no uh, uh, government action identifying these pockets where wages can fall and appropriate uh, uh, cost or wage uh, policy. Uh, programs being placed. Uh, I mean, I'm not aware of it. Uh, I'm sure government will address this quickly. Though uh, many people have pointed out this Mahatma Gandhi loan guarantee, employment guarantee scheme, many other schemes, direct cash transfer to farmers, marginal farmers, etc. Uh, do going, going to help. But then I'm not sure what extent this variation can be adjusted. Third important issue. Uh, now what I'm saying is that wage rate plays a critical issue in the productivity. Unless uh, there's, there's a consensus in the literature, the empirical literature, unless the wage sufficiently increases, it's difficult to increase the productivity. So this is one dimension has to flow from wage to productivity. Another one is water management. The water management is an issue that we are all aware. You know, I would like to look at this water management in three dimensions. One is groundwater management. Second one is canal irrigation. Third one is uh, rainfall harvesting or rainfall itself. Let's not talk in terms of management, but rainfall itself, how do you manage that? Now, having been said that, and a good amount of, uh, in fact, somebody pointed out we have to move uh, the NERG scheme much beyond you know, uh, water management. Now, I would say that social infrastructure that would be created with these through these schemes should essentially address the water management because unless the water management improves it's very difficult to develop the village very difficult to develop the rural area I and mean, i don't want to this is a well established fact i don't want to go into the people detail of it and a lot of research talk about the same thing therefore uh, uh, temporarily temporarily moved labor can be utilized before monsoon effectively takes place for the better management of the water rainfall management that could increase groundwater level and that better management can certainly contribute to the uh, increase in the productivity this is something that is very important and I don't know what extent this agroclimatical condition is connected to COVID. You know, these are all we are talking in at the backdrop of COVID-19, which I call it coronavirus effect or corona effect. Now, this corona effect uh, has only one dimension to speak on this. Of late, I'm getting uh, some sort of uh, empirical papers from my friends who are working in one of the a prominent paper written by Neeraj Kartagar from Mumbai University and also many other friends were predicting uh, the increase in the recovery rate owing to many other factors in the uh, coronavirus impact process. Now, if this is so, due to either climatical issue or many other factors that can contribute medically, if it can increase the recovery rate, it would amount to, in a way, that great amount of relief for the rural sector, and they can get it into farm activities. In that sense, I think uh, uh, climate cannot directly work, but then uh, we can, to some extent, uh, the climate can contribute, contain uh, the uh, effect of spread of uh, coronavirus, and then subsequently, it would look, this point is, uh, Something that I would uh, 
uh, it's non scientific to begin with, but then uh, this has an impact. When it comes to production effectively. Uh, now, this logistic management becomes very important. Production is not just about after post production management, it is also before producing what kind of uh, management, uh, logistic management that is effectively possible for input storing and input distribution, procurement, etc., can effectively lead to better. I think, uh, in my opinion, uh, the logistic uh, storing, supply side, and all that, if you look at it, uh, uh, the, the existing uh, data shows that uh, farmers effectively do not have private logistic management process at their disposal. Now, whatever is little available at rural level, at government sector, and it is for post production, not for pre production process. So now we are talking about a crop that will be harvested and the crop that will be coming into maybe another two, three months, not getting into this crop and that crop and all. And if you look at it in the entire production process, uh, there, is, there is a logistic management related to input, there's a logistic management related to post-production issues. Now this output uh, uh, management, uh, this logistic management is, is very, very critical. In, if this migration continues the way it is moving, then the harvesting can lead to 20 to 25 percent wastage in the harvesting. That is an optimistic estimate. The pessimistic estimate is 30 to 35 percent. I mean, this is a huge wastage. Although they have, we have produced, if you put together as rural sector, this is going to <coughs> cost you a lot. Then the storage uh, facilities at community level is very weak. This is something that we have been talking about, both from the logistic point of view and from marketing point of view. And I don't think that near future this can be changed. Uh, maybe it will take some time. And uh, that essentially because of the storing facilities, things are, in fact, uh, uh, Professor Shekhar was talking about the procurement. I don't know. Procurement for the government target, or procurement for the farmers, procurement for the, uh, the, the all parties who are connected to the agricultural sector. What we have to address, uh, uh, we don't know, but the, the procurement is not going to be effective unless the logistic management is increased, which is not possible in the short run. So we are going to accept these things. Second, uh, third, transportation. Transportation, I look at it from Four angle. Uh, one is moving directly towards market. I mean, whatever is harvested uh, right now. Another one is the logistics store. Third one is the procurement center and interstate movement. I think this all four issues are very, very dynamic issues. And this is going to be remaining the same. We have to manage the things, which means production is going to be uh, hit. Now I'm not going to entering into the cost of production. And uh, one more issue that I would like to touch upon, I know time is up, but then I'll take two more minutes. The substitution between labor and capital. Now the people who have moved out of the uh, rural sector, some area, what extent they are able to substitute the capital? This is a question mark. The people who have come into the particular rural area, what extent farmers, marginal farmers, small farmers, big farmers are able to substitute the labor, reaping the advantage of the, the labor market is something that is going to be very, very important for the productivity. And it is, it is something that I would not be able to speak. I can only raise question on that. Then availability of loans and advances are not directly directed to the culture. This is a very sad uh, part of it. And they have addressed it uh, the, uh, something which is other than the whole development in my opinion. There are some few policies. Then there has to be a shift. You know, if at all, if you accept that the farmers, small farmers, Marginal farmers, particularly, should not migrate to the urban center. 
or the migrated people should live as they have come back into their original rural background then you need to increase the non farm activities of farm activities and this this is going to be a big policy challenge if you ask me i do not have uh, uh, any great solution but i would i would simply say that this industry that industry that corporate this corporate uh, coming back to rural etc you know these are all even but i think one should move very scientifically on this issue and that can observe uh, i i somebody said that absorbance absorption of the labor uh, into agriculture sector is uh, very difficult but then uh, i am of the strong opinion that i am not talking about a gandhian model if the model which is suitable the model which can take care of the sustainability the model which can prominently address the non farm off farm activities can certainly absorb the rural labor and it would benefit immensely the sustainable goals that we are targeting for i think i have many thing to speak on and last only one point i would like to make from my earlier econometric model i have simulated for this particular exercise uh, both total factor productivity and uh, labor factor productivity uh, of course there are factors which increases the as as we pointed out uh, uh, as we have discussed there are factors which increases the total factor productivity and there are also factors which pulls down the total factor productivity but overall assuming that uh, the trend uh, moves as it is uh accepting the forecast variance instead of 10% uh, to 15% uh, because that variance uh, we have to accept because this is not something normal uh therefore if you go that way total factor productivity decreases by 10% in another 3 months to come maybe after one year the improvement is indicated number 1 number 2 as far as the labor factor productivity is concerned as i earlier pointed out let us labor factor productivity is increasing but then the increase in the labor factor productivity the labor market issue is not properly not handled you know what kind of employment that would emerge unemployment would emerge we are not aware of whether it is disguised unemployment seasonal unemployment or it is frictional in nature we do not actually know about it right now but assuming that we are not getting into any type of discussion on the type of unemployment if you look at the increase in the unemployment somewhere around 25% for the rural area then the productivity goes down by 20% which essentially indicates uh that wage rate might fall uh it might differ from pocket to pocket this is an aggregate uh, analysis uh it may in some area the fall can be significant some area it might increase as well etc so we can identify those pockets and address the productivity accordingly and thank you very much for patiently listening to me and once again i thank all panelists rajasthan economic association for organizing this webinar yeah, thank sir, you very much thank you thank you thank you very much sir for your uh, views on the productivity uh thank you to all the panelists for their uh, thought provoking presentation so uh, we are very very much short of time so but still we'll take a few questions few questions uh, for uh, all the speakers so uh, if you can have uh, all the speakers they can just switch on their videos uh, the first question uh, i think uh, we'll will be uh, asking professor uh, sudha narayanan uh, ma'am what should be the government strategy towards an increase in the rural employment demand uh you know keeping in mind that uh, narega is a solution but do you think that uh, it's a viable solution for an increased rural demand which has generated because of rural migration uh, i think the existing yeah. existing evidence on uh, uh, narega suggests that actually when when narega implementation improves uh the it has a general equilibrium effect on both wage rates and on uh, incomes so i think the evidence suggests that uh, uh, it, the, as a, as a as a way to stimulate demand it is a feasible program and i think uh, uh, that i think that's true uh, 
at the same time, I think we have to work at uh, and push multiple buttons because you can't put uh, everything in one basket. So I think you need to work on multiple uh, ways and uh, use different levers. So I leave it at that and give others an opportunity to talk. Yeah, anybody would like to uh, comment on that? Uh, or I'll move on to the next question. Yeah, so the next one is, uh, uh, as you pointed out, uh, it's for Rohini ma'am that, uh, you know, among the migrants, uh, many are skillful so that, you know, they can be extended. Uh, they, what can be the extended model of development to materialize their skills and to deter their absorption in Narega? Uh, Rohini ma'am? Yeah, I think the main thing is not to decide that top down. Uh, what the state should do, the basic principle of public economics is that the state should come in and do things that cannot be done well by the market. Uh, the biggest thing is really credit. Uh, and so right now what has been happening is that there have been top-down schemes like the uh, Kisan credit card scheme, the SAGs. Uh, now there's talk of farmer producer organizations. The biggest change that would help these people with skills is to say as long as banks know that they're going to be giving money back, if they feel confident about this, if SAGs feel confident about this, then just lend to anyone for anything. There's no evidence at all that lending for consumption, for example, is a bad idea. It might be critical, it might be what's needed. Uh, so let this be locally determined rather than top down and lend for whatever people want to lend to rather than deciding that these are the five schemes that we're going to support and give credit for. Fine. Yeah. Uh, the next question is uh, for Mr. Jada Krishnamurti. Uh, do you think that the alternative uh, agricultural intervention should come in like your experience in beekeeping from the government in order to provide employment? What can be such alternatives? Uh, there can be multiple alternatives and I would rather that they not come from the government in fact uh, because uh, one of the things that we do know is that the development sector has uh, uh, developed multiple uh, alternatives over the last many years. Pradhan for example has done tremendous work with poultry. Uh, there are a number of other organizations which have worked with uh, different kinds of uh, activities. Uh, the problem, like uh, Professor Somnathan just mentioned, is that government uh, generally tends to be top down. A good example is beekeeping, again, if I can take it up. Uh, in fact, uh, the, in the last week, three major newspapers in India, uh, the Hindu uh, Economic Times, and I wrote a piece in Life in Mint, uh, which talk about why the 500 crores that the finance minister has just mentioned for beekeeping uh, as part of the new package might not be the best thing because the way that the government thinks about it is like a, is they promote a hybrid bee, bee which looks at honey which might not be the best for small farmers uh, so my sense is that there are a number of alternatives across the country the northeast has its own set of uh, initiatives uh, it would be great if the government could factor all of this. Um, I know the Niti Aayog has now in the last couple of weeks become very active in terms of reaching out to uh, civil society organizations, asking them for alternatives. Uh, so maybe that dialogue can be fostered a lot more. Um, and uh, you'll probably get a lot of local solutions which make sense. Um, something that works in Odisha might not work in Gujarat. Uh, so uh, it might make sense to listen to local uh, local voices and local solutions for this. Yeah, the next question is to Professor Shekhar. Uh, do you think that the private involvement in agriculture produce marketing is the right strategy? Or do you think that there has to be a government involvement in the post-production for some point of time? See, actually, what is right or not actually depends on how actually this policy is implemented. I tell you what, uh, in the last few years, if you see, there has been a flip-flap uh, in terms of government policy. If you remember, in 2017, they came up with this electronic national agricultural market. Basically, that was supposed to be a national platform to help farmers discover price. And within a year, and that scheme, that whole project was not really implemented uh, the way it should have been. And as a result, by 2018, they came up with this huge thing about increasing the MSPs to cover 50% uh, more than the cost of production, and then this huge PM ASHA program under which deficiency payments and all these things were announced. 
and within the of just 2018 september they have done that again 2019 they have come back to direct uh, benefit transfers so this this whole flip flop now they have come back to again private uh, sector participation so this this uh, actually it, it implementation is a key that's why in my presentation i did uh, stress on that point whatever scheme they whatever programs that what uh, measures that I, they have announced actually the implementation is a key but i think this has more probability of working because right now what they have done is they are actually allowing farmers to trade across states and if they can actually bring in such a legislation which actually can be brought or brought under the concurrent list uh, the item 33 of the concurrent list then they can actually this can uh, change things this can be a game changer in, so to say but again the states have to be consulted there has to be a lot of back and forth consultation between states and uh, center for allowing this because states also have their own apprehensions about letting go of their control on apmcs and also the farmers produce passing through apmcs so that it's, it's a mess actually it all depends on how it is implemented yeah yeah so the next question is to dr shanmugam uh, do you think that the focus has to be on production productivity Uh, which has been the case till since independence, or it's the time that we focus more on the post-production aspects. Okay, okay, okay. Now, now we we can't have a trade-off like this. We can't have a trade-off like this. Productivity uh, is a very important thing, and which is also connected to the production. Now, one should aim at increasing the productivity. Automatically, production increases, and post-production management uh, is very important. uh not only it would affect marketing and prices but also it would solve the food security problems okay now if you look at the 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 factors that govern the post production management factors that govern productivity they are different now the policy the government policy that uh, has to address both the things has to be accordingly dealt with now there are hope uh, at least i i i believe there are hope that people are now realizing farmers increasingly farmers are realizing that it is not production per se the productivity is very very important why that is important it not only increases their production it also increases their farm income and the possibility of marketing uh, also now widespread expanded so therefore that is one issue second issue is the logistic management is very weak in india post production logistic management it's a very vast field let's not debate here and yeah thank you thank you sir so i just uh, uh, i think uh, all of us can uh, conclude because i think we are short of time and uh, it's been i think more more than one and a half hours so in yeah. just a minute if you could just conclude uh, just keeping in mind i have one general question which you can uh, you know rope in into your uh, final remarks uh, you know do we see that this uh, impact of covid can be a positive thing for agriculture and it may lead to uh, you know some positive effects on agriculture in times to come so keeping that in mind if you could just give your final remarks in just a minute starting with the uh, dr narayanan i think the covid crisis has showed many rural actors and rural based actors working on the supply chain what the uh, new directions that they can take and they've tested some uh, waters and and the fpos are an example many of them have done things that they didn't think they could do before so in that sense yes it's an opportunity it's also good that the government is thinking about uh, revisiting many of the laws that are archaic and maybe needs change but at the end of the day the devil is in the details and um, we have to orient ourselves to problems as they are on the ground and not as we perceive it to be and i think professor somnathan's point about uh, local and uh, being being context relevant is quite important at this stage so i would not uh, i would wait to see whether this opportunity is actually taken advantage of by government okay thank you uh, na, uh, professor somnathan now uh, i would just say yes that you know the main thing to keep in mind is that everyone is supposed to be equal in a democracy we have to protect all its citizens and that doesn't involve dividing 
the economic policy that each area should follow. It does involve uh, providing relief when it's needed. So programs like the NREGA, the uh, huge infrastructural development, improving the quality of schools. These are all critical. The government should push with that. And for everything else, it should give funds to states and local organizations and let them think what is best for them. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Ms. Udana Krishnamurthy? Uh, well, uh, the short answer to that is yes, opportunities are plentiful. Uh, the solutions are also there. It's just that uh, one needs to be open to them and uh, um, ensure that it is done in the right fashion, keeping the interests of the community in mind. Uh, I think that's very critical. Uh, so um, I would leave it there. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Professor Shekhar? Yeah, I would say it's, it's, it's basically uh, a very good opportunity. And also, I'm glad that the government has at least uh, made use of this opportunity to usher in some of the long overdue reforms, particularly on the Essential Commodities Act and also the interstate uh, trading by the farmers. But as uh, Professor Somnathan said, I would completely agree with that because one thing that is needed is actually giving more autonomy to states and also to plan their own uh, path or trajectory of agricultural growth because ultimately all said the implementation has to be at the state level. So I think that is key, not only state, but also to the down, uh, to the lower levels. Actually, in the, if you remember, if you, uh, about 10 years ago, around 2008, there was something which was started when uh, Professor Vijay Sen was in the planning commission, what is called district agricultural plans. So every, all the states were required to make district agricultural plans with details of what are the resource, uh, resources available in the districts, what are the constraints, and what is the capital pattern that's likely to be. In fact, uh, that actually resulted in a lot of uh, growth coming from the first time from rain-fed regions in the following two, three, four, four years. Unfortunately, that has been given up in the last few years completely. And I think we'll, with these reforms on one side, particularly ECA and marketing, said reforms. Then the focus should now shift to giving more autonomy to states and also to the lower levels, particularly at the district level, block level, and let them come up with their own plans of how to, they want to go about their agriculture, making use of these particular these reforms at the national. I think it's a good opportunity and they should grab it with both hands. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Dr. Shandaman? Yes. Uh, uh, this corona is blessing in disguise. In fact, uh, in the sense, blessing in disguise in the sense that uh, we started evaluating the karma that we are doing on the earth right now. It is not just the agriculture sector. Uh, it is the entire life as a whole, this is the planet and other uh, things. I'm sure it is going to impact agriculture positively. I'm very optimistic about it. In fact, some biologists said that other than man, if other creatures of the God is not there, the world will end. If man is not there, if other, every other creations are present, then world will flourish. Yeah. So that is going to be the fact. And that's going to be, I think man should learn easily and quickly and uh, painfully all these lessons. And another, before uh, another corona catches him, he should be prepared to change the world, the kind of order that we have been following. Now, having been said this, uh, one issue that I would like to mention is the subsidy. You know, subsidy is incentive up to certain level. Otherwise, it will become dead by dead. Of course, I understand in, in, in representative democracy, uh, many things play a role, including subsidy. But what extent subsidy can be incentive to the production, consumption, is something has to be very well articulated before any policy for rural development is pitched. Secondly, more importantly, as Professor Seker rightly pointed out, if rural development takes the momentum, the level of poverty will certainly come down. Real poverty versus nominal poverty, real poverty versus pseudo poverty can be debated here. I think, uh, in my opinion, if, if, you, if you want to really look at this is how we can look at it. Lastly, and more importantly, the, the increasing productivity and 
the marketing logistic management these are the key issues you know apart from social political socio political socio economic policies i think we should look at it as a very very important factor before we waste the resources if we do not address the productivity you are wasting the resources economics is all about not just producing it is better utilization of the resources so if you do not get it into productivity uh, in much more detail in practical sense you are going to lose the bus secondly equally important is logistic and marketing management it has to go in hand in hand i thank everyone thank you sir yeah thank uh, you the economic society and i thank yash and my dear friend vvc thank you thank you sir so i'll request in the end professor vijayveer singh to just sum up the discussion over to you sir yes uh, sir thank you here after this discussion one two things are very clear that is the migrant workers are not coming back to cities for a while and second option is that the dependence on farm activities is to be reduced so we have to look towards the non farm activities then question is that when this migrants are not coming back soon to cities then certainly where they are going to be absorbed for the time being so obviously two three options for this time being is that is one is the nregs and second issue is that skilled people who have on to rural areas they can look for some business opportunities or non farm activities in rural areas only that can work as an opportunity but for that one thing is very important we have to visualize this that agriculture is a state subject and policy at the national level being implemented by the state government at the local level so these three tiers policies are to be identified activities are to be identified very clearly and there we need coordination between these three tiers as uh, professor roini said that no one wants to lose power second issue is what professor somnath has said that is provisioning of public goods in rural areas creation of infrastructure very nice but these are long term activities and one thing we are demanding for the long time that the disparity between the rural infrastructure and urban structure is to be reduced but the pace is very slow and i don't think uh, that going to be very uh, fast soon self help group is certainly a good option because self help ssg network in states i have seen in rajasthan is a very strong network that can be a very uh, good option and i was impressed when uh, professor roini soni roini somnathan uh, described conceptualized the aatmanirbhar bharat that is the true purpose that if you believe in the local product local brand that is the best for creating demand for these people green create giving opportunity to these people to produce something for sujana krishnamurthy has said that is the beekeeping is not an only the agricultural input but it provides revenue so you are investing so you are getting two things as an input as best as the revenue and creating of value chain in this area is certainly a very uh, good area but again i will go with her when she says that we should not be looking towards government for everything the things certain things are to be created locally but for everything we cannot depend on the government when professor stek shekar said there always there is no issue of supply side distribution is not also not a serious issue the serious issue is going to be the demand side problem one aspect was that certainly the direct relief to the people but here we should realize that rural households are well identified but migrant workers are not well identified that who are the people who have migrated to rural areas what are they detail what type of relief they require financial assistance how much assistance is to be given so data has to be there when we suggest that nregc nregs for private land for private construction private property remember 
that agriculture labor also has a limitation because people have gone for high tech agriculture people living in north area can realize now you do not find any cattle any manual labor in villages the harvesting machines start from punjab and go till bihar and people are the farmers are sitting idle they do not have as such so we have to look that at that parameter also how much labor can be absorbed in the private land and one thing is certain with that the rural base rate is certainly going to decline in the short term one issue that is certainly if we can produce uh, uh, locally like agro processing units and all this is a very good idea but two things which are not in the control of government they are in the control of farmers and farmers can do it one is the crop diversification we have to divert the crops we cannot depend only on crops of food grains and second important area is we have to look towards the livestock activity also which we have absolutely forgotten that we are not thinking in that area so with that i thank everyone and i conclude here thank you sir uh, in the end i just uh, want to thank on behalf of the niti aayog chair the indian economic society and uh, the rajasthan economic association to our panelists professor vijay veer singh uh, dr sudha narayanan uh, professor roini somnathan ms sujana krishnamurthy professor shekhar and dr shanmugam for sparing their time and giving us their relevant opinion on this issue uh, which is very important for us and also i would like to thank dr gl meena secretary rea and uh, dr bula choudhury executive member for their support for the conduction of this webinar thank you everyone i would also like to thank all the pa panelists uh, for, uh, the participants for joining us for this webinar we'll be coming up with the next webinar uh, soon thank you everyone for joining thank you thank you thank you, thank you.